Hello, this is CJ Hoyle, and welcome to day two of my solo canoeing adventure on the Severn River. After a quiet evening camp down here at the bottom of the Swift Rapids lock number 43 lock station, this morning I'm going to be getting everything packed up into the canoe and paddling further down the Severn River until I reach Georgian Bay. So with the plan of having a nice early day on the water, the time is currently 545 and my first task for this morning is to take everything out of the tent and get it packed down. And just like that, my campsite is no longer. So before I hit the water, I'm going to take a walk up to the top of the lock station to use the bathroom building and get ready for the day. All right, so I've got everything ready to go. Now all that's left to do is to walk back down to the bottom of the lock, and put everything in that canoe, and begin my journey heading down the Severn River, continuing in the west direction. So the time is now 6.37, and the canoe is loaded and ready to go. So things are nice and calm and still on the river this morning, just like you'd hope when you woke up at 5.30 in the morning to get started. So I have about 13 kilometers to paddle to get to the next lock station, which is Lock 44, the Marine Railway. The reason I decided to leave at around 6.30 or so is because the lock station doesn't open until 9, so there's really no point in getting there any earlier, because I definitely want to see the Marine Railway operating. The loon flying overhead. It's so nice having the entire river to myself like this. Well, I had the lake to myself for a while, but there's the first boat of the day, and in the distance I can see someone heading towards me in what looks like a kayak. It really is such a beautiful morning out here on the river. Over here on my right is a bar and restaurant, which is one of the few places where you can stop to get food here along this portion of the Trent Severn Waterway. When I was planning out my trip, I had briefly considered that maybe on the night when I was camping at Swift Rapids that I might paddle to that restaurant and back for dinner. But considering that I paddled about almost four kilometers to get here, that would have added an extra almost eight kilometers to my day. So I'm glad that I decided to bring a package dinner instead. This narrow section of the river up ahead looks like it has some pretty noticeable current, which will be pulling me through it. So I'm now paddling through an area known as the Severn Falls, and over there you can see the River House Restaurant, which is another place where I was considering that I might have stopped at for my dinner on day one in the early planning stages of my trip. Up ahead I've got a railway bridge to paddle underneath of. This bridge carries the Canadian Pacific, or CP Rail Line, unlike the one that I saw yesterday which carried the CN Rail. However, much like that other railway bridge that I passed underneath of yesterday, because the river is pretty narrow here, there's definitely some current pulling me through. After I get through here though, I think I'm going to take a break over there on that shore there, where I'll stop to have my breakfast. The time is now just about 8 o'clock, and I paddled almost 6 kilometers, and on the menu for breakfast this morning is the campsite overnight oats that I prepared last night. Alright, I'm finished my breakfast, and ready to keep on paddling. It almost looks like I'm paddling into a dead end over there, but according to my map, the river does continue over that way. Yup, just another narrow spot on the river with an island in the middle. This island here is called Buckskin Island. So the time is now about 8.45, and I paddled 9 kilometers so far, and aside from a couple of boats that have passed me, things are still really quiet this morning. Look at that slide on top of that boathouse there. The suicide. So that island over there to the right is called Ritchie Island, and just around that corner up ahead is Big Chute. Alright, so I've rounded the corner, and that big yellow thing that you can see straight ahead with all the structure on it, that is the Big Chute Marine Railway, lock number 44. So since I've purchased a lock permit for this canoe, my plan is that I'm going to use that railway to transport the canoe and all the stuff inside it from this level of the river up here down to the lower level of the river where I'll be continuing from. So as I was pulling up, it looked like a boat had just left from the railway, but the railway seems to be waiting there up at the top, but I'm hoping they'll come down this way to pick me up. So they've now got the road over there closed, and you can see that the railway cradle is heading towards me to come into the water where I can paddle on top of it. All right, so that cradle is now heading down into the water. So they've called me on, so I'm gonna paddle in there, and they said to bring the canoe to the front left. All right, here we are inside, beginning our way down the hill. So the original Marine Railway here first opened in 1917, and it was really just done sort of as a temporary measure before they could get around to building sort of a permanent lock like they have at the other lock stations. And the reason they built this instead of a lock was because it was just after World War I, 
And they did this as sort of a temporary measure to be able to complete the system without having to spend a lot of money. Uh, but it ended up staying here, well, really until today. But they did upgrade it in the 1970s to the marine railway that you can see here today, which is much larger than the original one. When they were building this iteration of the marine railway, once again, they considered that they might replace it with actual locks. But one of the reasons why they decided not to was because there was an invasive species in Georgian Bay called the sea lamprey, and they had problems with it spreading, and they were concerned that if they built a lock, then the sea lamprey would be able to migrate up into these lakes back over this way, and they didn't want that, that to happen. And the marine railway actually provides a good method for stopping it from spreading. So there's definitely a pretty steep hill that the railway needs to travel down. And I believe the elevation difference between the water at the bottom and the water at the top is about 18 meters. All right, so here we are touching down into the water. And now I can keep on paddling. Before I paddle any further though, I'm gonna park the canoe over here so that I can walk around a little bit and explore this lock station. Down here at the bottom of the marine railway is the Big Chute Generating Station. Big Chute Generating Station has a nameplate capacity of 10 megawatts. So over here next to the generating station are the tracks of the previous marine railway. The tracks that the older marine railway ran on look very similar to standard railroad tracks. And over here you can see the old cradle for the marine railway. Now this isn't actually the original marine railway. This one was completed in the 1920s to replace the original one, which was quite small. They continued to operate this one up until 2005, even after the present day one was completed, and they only used this one really for days when there was a lot of extra boat traffic, sort of as overflow. So just like the present day railway, this one would have come over this way and gone across the road and into the water there at the top. So there you can see the present day marine railway, which I took the canoe across earlier, making its way back up the hill. And you can see that it's using cables here, which are what tows it up and down the hill. Now they're closing the road so that the railway can cross. And over here on the other side of the railway are the Big Chute Rapids, which is the reason why the railway is needed. So here they're loading two more boats inside the railway. So they've strategically got the boats positioned in the correct place so that they will get supported by some slings that they've raised from the bottom of the cradle there. Looks like each boat gets one sling and the front of the boat will just sit on the wooden deck where my canoe was sitting earlier. And here they come across the road. Now notice how the railway has two sets of tracks. The front of the cradle holds onto the outside where the back holds onto the inside set of tracks, and that's so it can maintain being level when it's going down such a steep hill without the entire cradle needing to tilt forwards. Here it comes down the hill. And there it goes into the water. And the boats are able to float again. And away they go. So as the Marine Railway takes another load of boats back up to the top side, I'm back here in the canoe and ready to keep on paddling. The time is now about 10.40 and I'm halfway to my destination for today. This area of the river down here at the bottom of the Big Chute is called the Gloucester Pool. Up ahead the river goes through another narrow channel and there's a warning about strong current. Well, there's that channel, although I don't really see very much current. Nothing compared to what I saw yesterday, at least. So after the narrows, the river opens right back up again, and it looks a lot more like a lake here. This portion of the river here has a lot of islands on it, and many of those islands have cottages. And over there, that's where I'm heading to. As I've been paddling my way through these islands, in addition to my GPS, which has been helping me navigate, I've also been using the channel markers to help. You can see on the right up ahead, there is a dark colored green square. And further in the distance, you can see a red triangle. 
And the way that these navigation markers work is when you're heading downstream like I'm doing right now, the green squares are supposed to be on your right and the red triangles are supposed to be on your left. So there, I've just about reached that red marker. The time is just after 12 noon and I paddled about 19 and a half kilometers so far. In the direction where I'm paddling, the sky remains kind of gray and cloudy, but back behind me, it seems to be clearing up into a nice blue sky. So here I'm paddling through another set of narrows. And once I'm through here, I'll be within a water body known as Little Lake, which will be the last lake that I'll be paddling through before I get to Port Severin, my destination for today. Here's another narrow section to paddle through amongst the cottages and islands. Now here around this corner is Little Lake. Now it's important to point out that this is not the only lake in Ontario that's known as Little Lake. In fact, it's not even the only lake on the Trent Severn Waterway that's known as Little Lake. In the city of Peterborough, in between Lock 19 and 20, there's also a small lake there that's known as Little Lake, and I camped on that lake last year on my solo canoeing adventure of the Trent Severn Waterway. That's a police boat over there. So up ahead I can see Port Severn coming into view. Look at all those turtles over there on that island. Those are actually relatively big turtles. They're very much aware of me and want to jump back in the water. So I'm just piling past a few of the marinas and up ahead over there should be the lock station. All right, so here I've arrived at Log 45, Port Severin. So I can see that there's some boats inside that lock there, which will probably be letting out pretty soon and I'll be able to paddle inside. And here come the gates. And you can see that this lock station has manually operated gates and controls. Everything's operated by human power. All right, and there come those boats. Log 45 has the smallest capacity of any of the locks in the system, and that's because similar to the Big Chute Marine Railway, which is implemented as sort of a temporary measure to be able to complete the waterway, this one was built in the same way with just sort of a small lock, which was just going to be temporary, but more than 100 years later, it's still here and the same size. All right, so here I am loaded up inside of Log 45, and I've also got some company coming in behind me. All right, so there they are starting to open up the drain valves and the canoes starting to go down. So with my visit to Lock 45 Port Severn today, me and this canoe have now visited every single lock on the Trent Severn waterway. And this lock will lower me down all the way to the level of Georgian Bay, which is part of Lake Huron. All right, so we're all the way down at the bottom now and there come the gates. All right, so I'm out of the lock and the lock staff were warning me about this strong current that's right here that I have to paddle through. So looking back that way, you can see the lock over on the left and the dam over on the right, which is currently under construction. So this bridge up ahead here is for Highway 400. My plan is to just paddle out through there so that I'll officially be in Georgian Bay. So as you can see, I've arrived at my ultimate destination for this trip, which is Georgian Bay. And from here, the Trent Severn Waterway goes no further. So from here, I'm gonna head over that way and I'm gonna pass underneath of Highway 400 again and I'm gonna go to the Starport Marina, which is where I'm gonna get picked up for today. So that marina is just over there. So a slight change of plans. It turned out my dad wasn't able to park at the Starport Marina. So I'm back here at the log station and I'm gonna take the lock up back up to the top and that's where I'm gonna get picked up from. So here I am back in the lock again. All right, here I am back up at the top and here come those gates. So I met my dad at the public boat launch on Kelly's Road in Port Severn, arriving there at around 2.30 p.m. We loaded up the canoe and headed back home after my enjoyable two-day weekend trip. My total paddling distance on day two was 27.3 kilometers, which brings my total for the trip to 54.8 kilometers. I definitely recommend this trip to other paddlers, as long as you don't mind sharing the water with motorboat traffic. I hope you enjoyed joining me on my mini solo canoeing adventure on the Severn River. If you watched all the way to the end of it, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comment section below, and thanks for watching.